Welcome to Delivering Miracles, a podcast to teach women like you tips and strategies on how you can have a safer pregnancy so you can bring home a healthy baby. I'm your host and your high-risk pregnancy expert, Farijat Deshpande. I can't wait to chat with you. A while back, I was having a really amazing session with one of my incredible clients. And typically the sessions go where we talk to each other about what she's going through and support for her and how to help her manage her anxiety and her mood and her stress and help her make lifestyle changes that are necessary to help her stay pregnant, right? But this particular session, she started talking about her husband Now, to be really honest with you, I started thinking, oh gosh, she's gonna, there must have been something that happened in their relationship. They must have had a fight. Um, That's probably what she's gonna be talking about. So I kind of geared up for that type of conversation. And actually, the conversation went in a completely different direction. The session turned toward her feeling helpless because her husband was really struggling. And she shared with me that she was, I think at the time she was about 28 or so weeks pregnant, and her husband was diagnosed with depression. And he'd never had a history of depression before, he'd never been depressed before, and she was uh, on bed rest now. I think this was her second or third pregnancy. She'd lost the first two, so I bet this was her third pregnancy. And... She was on bed rest because she had a cerclage placed and she was told to take it really, really easy because she was at risk for delivering early. And she said that her husband had started feeling really down. You know, at first he was just feeling really isolated or really far and distant from her she thought okay well maybe he's stressed at work maybe there's something else going on maybe he's just really exhausted from having to take care of everything now that she's on bed rest and the more time that went on the more he started getting agitated he wasn't sleeping as well he just didn't seem like himself and so she urged him to go see the doctor which he didn't do so she encouraged him to come to her next OB appointment And like a week before, a few days before she and I had our call, he had gone to her OB appointment and and she mentioned to her doctor, which I thought was a really great idea to make sure that he got some support because he wasn't going on his own. So she mentioned to her obstetrician, hey, this this is going on. My husband doesn't seem like himself. He seems really down. He's really withdrawn. He's getting really agitated. He just, he doesn't seem like him. What's going on? And her OB was so savvy to be able to recognize that her husband was experiencing depression during her pregnancy. Now, this is not something that's really that unusual, but we just don't talk about it. The Journal of American Medical Association actually says that 10% of women, I'm sorry, 10% of men worldwide show signs of depression anywhere from the first trimester of their wife's pregnancy through six months after the child is born. And in fact, actually, between the three to six month postpartum period, so when baby's three to six months old, that number for men showing signs of depression spikes to about 26%, which is more than double the rate of depression that we typically see in men in general. And I thought that is fantastic that her OB was able to recognize that because this is an entire family, a, a, a couple. There are many people who are being affected by a high risk pregnancy. It's not just mom. Of course, you're the one carrying the baby all the hormones are raging through you. You've got to deal with the physical complications, the mental complications, absolutely. But we just don't talk enough about the partner's experience and what that's like. 
So I got this idea after I had that session that I was thinking, well, how can we do this? How can we do this? I'd love to have this conversation about the husband or the partner's experience of a high-risk pregnancy. And then I got an idea the idea over dinner. I was looking at my husband. He was just happily eating his dinner, totally oblivious to these ideas that were going on in my head. I turned to him and he's he just looked at me and he goes, what? You've got that look in your eye, what? <laughs> and I said, hey, you want to be on my podcast? <laughs> and he said, no. <laughs> and it has been weeks in the making that I finally gotten him to agree to join us on Delivering Miracles to talk about his experience of being a partner of a wife who had a very high risk pregnancy. So I'm super excited to be introducing you to my husband today. Welcome, Sonil. Thank you for having me on after after all the all the discussions about whether we should do this. Um, Thanks it, for it, finally agreeing. <laughs> excited to be here, of course. Awesome. So now you kind of see what I do when I say I'm podcasting and recording my episodes. This this is what it's all about. Yeah, and now I I see when you're when you're in here with all all the equipment and everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I just I mean, let's just start at the beginning. I mean, tell tell us what was your experience of my high risk pregnancy? Hmm. Well, um well, I, I think the biggest thing that really st- stood out to me was, um, I mean, I mean, first it was very intense the whole way through. It was like really stressful. Like there was always something happening, something to be worried about. And, and I, I think for me it was, it was like, there's really like very little I could actually do about it. Like I, I, I felt very much like on the outside kind of looking in, kind of just waiting for updates of like what's happening, what's not happening is, is time passing fast enough or or not but but nothing I could actually do about it and I think that made it that I think that was really one of the hardest parts for me is like like when I was when it was stressful and and when I was worried about what was going to happen there's nothing really to do a lot of the time but just like like sit and wait that's the worst feeling isn't it I mean I felt like I had to sit and wait too but you're right like I had access to information that you didn't I knew how my body was feeling I knew what was it like what it felt like when something was wrong when I, and I knew when something what it felt like when something wasn't wrong but you didn't know that unless I told you yeah yeah exactly and and there's no, nothing I could like actually do about it or or or, or know about it like if if, if if um if I wasn't there or, or something yeah yeah not not that I would saying I would really wish we could have traded places or anything <laughs> Didn't, didn't look like that much fun from your side either, but but I I, th- I think that the not knowing was the part, or not not like having anything to do about it was like one of the things that really stood out for me. Well, and I think that's that's part of the reason why I do the work that I do, right? Is because that helplessness, it it just spirals out of control. It shoots mm-hmm. your anxiety through the roof. It brings your mood down. I mean, it's one of the biggest risk factors for developing depression. And as you see from the the story that I shared about my client, it can happen to partners too and so it's really important that you find ways to be useful and to be helpful to combat that feeling of Mm -hmm. helplessness do you remember things that you would do that would help you feel less helpless I I think just kind of and you're right like anytime I was doing something whether it's like making making food for you or or like doing some of the things like around the house that that we would both share or something just like doing all all of that like anything like that or like taking you to the doctor like like all that stuff where I I felt like I was doing something to contribute I think helped yeah yeah and you did a lot for sure I remember that you were just kind of like speedy Gonzalez just running from (laughs) one place to another and managing the house and going to work and then cooking food and then doing all the dishes yeah, and then no, no time to think about what was happening then. Right, which we've talked about isn't mm-hmm. a great coping strategy <laughs> in the long run. <laughs> but in the short run, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that you want to stay busy. If you think back to that time, though, um, what was the hardest part about being a partner during a high-risk pregnancy, would you say? Um, I think 
I, I mean, I, I think just kind of the hardest part is both both seeing what you were going through as well as being worried about the baby at the same time and kind of when when you suddenly realize that like some of your worst fears are actually now like very possible I, I, I think like some of those moments where it really feels dangerous were the hardest parts yeah yeah totally because then you add on to the fact that you're feeling helpless and you're on the outside and then you're seeing me struggling and then you're thinking oh my gosh maybe the baby won't survive and it's like yeah how do you even deal with that how did you how did you get through moments like that well part of it is like at some of the worst moments you were still being yourself and ask, saying things like hey did you remember to eat dinner and <laughs> and, 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 and reminding me of stuff like that so I, I think that that kind of helps that i was more than anything confused while why you were worried about whether i'd eaten or not when, <laughs> when ev- everything seemed to be falling apart um but I, I i think did i ask you that when i got on magnesium for the first time too I I think you might have. Yeah. <laughs> I was hallucinating. Magnesium completely made me hallucinate. I was I'd wake up every night just freaking out from hallucinations. My face felt like it was set on fire. My body was like as if they had dipped it into the Arctic Ocean and I was worried about whether you'd eat. Yeah, and there I was. I probably had already eaten. <laughs> got gone to the other room to get one of those cereal boxes and was was enjoying my cereal box and then <laughs> when when you're having the magnesium then yeah I asked me about it <laughs> but I think you bring up a good point of of finding ways to interject normalcy in the middle yeah. of all the chaos mm-hmm. can be really relieving for both people but I'm I'm hearing especially for you being on the outside just kind of having that reminder that okay it's still my wife it's still us it's still, like there is some sense of familiarity of our life that yeah. that does mm-hmm. exist in the middle of all this nonsense. Yeah, especially when because like something like this, like the high risk pregnancy can go on for so long. It's not like it's not just like a few days. Like this is going on for months, and I think you kind of have to have you have to have something like normal, something hap- like that that you're kind of used to happening while while all this is happening. Yeah, how did you take care of yourself? Did you take care of I, yourself? I, I think you know the answer to this. I, 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 I don't. I, we need some I think witnesses that's a, here. That's a trick question here. I, I, I really don't think I did too much to, to take care of myself. Then, um, I, I, I think it was just a lot of kind of finding things to do, see what I can do to help out. Um, I, I think that was that was really the most I was, I was doing to take care of myself. Yeah. So if you guys are listening. If you are pregnant or if you are the partner of somebody pregnant, don't do what Sonil did. (laughs) Make sure to take care of yourself because just like he said, the high-risk pregnancy is a marathon. It goes on for weeks and months, best case, right? We're aiming for 40 weeks here. And you can't get through a marathon thinking, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I'll take care of myself tomorrow because tomorrow, best case, tomorrow there's going to be a baby coming home and then that's a whole new chapter of your life of complete exhaustion. So great ways to take care of yourself. Take some time off. Get Take a break from everything that's going on. I mean, you get to walk away from this, so you should be able to walk away from it. Uh, meet with friends, go out with coworkers, just sit quietly and watch some TV, put on a game, put on a movie, like whatever you need to take a break from it because you need to refuel and replenish. And I'll tell you, as a, as a wife, I would have loved to see you do that. Part of me would have been like, seriously? <laughs> seriously, you're leaving the house right yeah, now? Yeah, now, now <laughs> you would love to see it. I don't, I don't know what you felt back then. If... But oh, I would have because... i going to Vegas for the weekend. Like, <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not Vegas, but, <laughs> but I mean, even as a partner, it, there's a sense of guilt of sitting there, you know, mm-hmm. being on bed rest, watching your your husband or your partner go through so much and then not be able to do anything about it. So it's mm-hmm. kind of this cyclical pattern that you're both in yeah. of both feeling guilty, both feeling helpless, both feeling exhausted and nobody really doing anything about it. At mm-hmm. least yeah. that's what happened in our case. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, tell us a little bit about what you remember from the high-risk pregnancy. Do you have any particular memories that are especially great or especially 
awful <laughs> that uh, you would for, love to share today? Particular memories. Um, like what stands out to you when you think about that time? Well, I guess um, uh, probably, well, I guess missing the actual birth is is, <laughs> is one of them, but... We did I, talk I, about I, that. I, know you, <laughs> I actually know that. I, 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 I heard her in here one day, like talking about that. I was wondering, oh, who's she telling the story about now? And then, of course, it's she's in front of the microphone. So now, okay, great. Like the, all, all, they're, all the podcast listeners now know about how I miss the, the, <laughs> the birth of our child. <laughs> so this is, it's, it's out there. It's on the internet. It's going to live forever. Great. <laughs> Um, but but I I think just that kind of looking back on it like I was like you you were in the hospital and I was still like going to work pretty soon after that and I I, I think kind of looking back I think I think it speaks to kind of how how used to like that whole like situation and kind of that life we got to that it, it didn't really it got to the point where it wasn't really that didn't feel that crazy like the situation we were in that it almost felt like oh normal so this is kind of normal life and kind of started doing normal things to like like a little uh, I think a lot more than really made sense to yeah looking back now right but you kind of become inured to it at some point when you're on complication number five and you're not even halfway through the second trimester you're like oh this this yeah I I remember early on when there, there were multiple complications at the beginning and then it was like one of them we we resolved and, and moved past and there are still a couple others. It was just such a relief that, oh, now now we only have this complication to deal with. And like, that's the only thing. Like, what a what a wonderful relief when I think if like a few months before you'd said that this was going to happen, like it would, it would not have felt like good at all. Right. Totally. The context absolutely matters. Yeah. In that mm-hmm. case. Um, what else, anything else that stands out to you when you think about that, that time? Um, I think just sitting around in the hospital, like looking at the clock, waiting, like counting for the clock to go to the next hour so we could say, yes, we made it to another day (laughs) and we'll never forget that. And, and, and like, and, and celebrate. Um, and I think, I, I, and I think just like kind of how we tried to like, I guess entertain ourselves in the hospital and and like whatever like we saw so or, many movies. Yes, we saw a lot of movies. Yeah, I, I, th- I think there's there's multiple shows and movies that now remind me of high risk pregnancy. Like, <laughs> w- Once upon a time reminds yes. me. Yes, Rumpelstiltskin reminds me of high risk pregnancy now. <laughs> me so. too. Yeah, that one. And what was the other one that we were watching? Um. Was it? I started watching Scandal when I was on bed rest. But there's another one that we watched together. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I no. Okay, I, I, but yeah, I, I agree with you with think... Once Upon a Time, and um, Pixar movies. We watched Cars. We saw yes. Tangled. Is that Tangled? Uh, not Pixar. No, but you, yeah. I always you, think you it hate is. Tangled now because of this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Tom Cruise. Mission yes. Impossible. Yeah, Mission Impossible 4, I think it was. I yeah. don't think I remember that movie at all. I remember this big garage and stuff and just not being happy. And <laughs> and this gar- I, I, I don't know, maybe it was more Tom Cruise than the pregnancy that made me not happy. It's <laughs> hard to tell, but it was probably a little of both. But. <laughs> Didn't help, that's for sure. <laughs> what do you... What do you think, if you just kind of step back from this whole experience, what do you think people don't realize about a partner's experience of a high-risk pregnancy? I think, I mean, I, I guess, um, like, just how, how big, um, how, how big a part of your life it, it really becomes. I mean, like, like the, just even if you're not doing something even even if like you're away at work just how much it's always on your mind like wondering what's happening at home um and and like like it's always kind of weighing on you like it's like always there always in your head like wondering what's happening mm. that is i'm glad you said that i i, I want to reiterate that for those of you who are listening that i know i didn't really understand this but partners also I mean it's on their mind 
constantly and it's taking a toll on them constantly and even the fact that they are one step removed from it does affect how worried they are and how much it impacts their their mood and their anxiety because it doesn't go away even though you do get to t- physically step away you're not really mentally stepping away and ever mm-hmm. yeah yeah i think that's huge i think that's huge and i, I know that I forgot that. I mean, and to be honest, I didn't even really think about it. I was just like, oh, you're so lucky. You don't have to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I guess you had other things going on then. Yeah. But. but but I mean, I think it's a really great point that for those moments when if you are have a high-risk pregnancy and you are feeling okay, you know, you're having a brief reprieve from whatever it is that you're going through, any complications, medical side effects, anything like that, um, to really be mindful of the fact that, okay, if you're feeling better, maybe this is a good time to check in with your partner to see how he or she's feeling. Because while you've been going through whatever treatments and protocols and in and out of the hospital and IVs and bleeding or whatever it is that's going on, contractions, your partner has been really struggling with you too. And and he or she's probably looking really strong and keeping it together for you. But when you have those moments when the sun peeks through, turn to your partner and ask them, how are you doing? How, are you, how Is there anything I can do to help you? And and maybe the answer is no. Maybe all they need is for you to just sit with them and, and listen or talk. I mean, you tell me, like, would you have wanted that? Would you have wanted to just sit and talk? Or what would you have wanted? Yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I, I, I think it would have been good to, I mean, I mean, we were kind of like doing so much like to, I, I think if we talked kind of like backed up and like talked about like what's going on and like what's being hard about it and like I, I think I mean it's tough but if if we were able to kind of take the time to do that I think I think it might have at least just maybe just helped put things in perspective a little bit yeah and then you're in it together yeah yeah and then you remember that you're in it together because because I mean, experiences are so separate yeah right like when one person is pregnant and like isn't supposed to walk around or anything and, <laughs> and the other person like can and like has, has no physical changes right or lying or, upside down stuck in a hospital bed yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> while the other one is going to work yeah ex- <laughs> exactly which will one day be all over the internet <laughs> <laughs> what type of support do you wish partners had access to during a high-risk pregnancy I, I think since, I mean, like the, the biggest concern, the biggest thing that, that you want to do as a partner is like, what can I do to help? And so, so I think maybe like kind of more support in, in that way of like ideas on like, what can you do to help? And to, to maybe norm, normalize that, maybe a chance to like hear from other people who have been in a similar situation to kind of know that like you're not going through it alone like other people have been through this and and have ideas and like the type of things that may help your 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 wife who you who may not be able to say or at the time articulate like what she needs so I, I think that kind of stuff like would would be most helpful yeah I think that makes a lot of sense I mean the theme that I keep hearing over and over is tell me what to do give me action items tell me what I can do to make it better because you can't, I mean, it, it's just so big and yeah. it's so overwhelming sometimes that even if you can just chip away at a small piece of it, that would make such a difference. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, like and any, any kind of, I, I, I think, and, and any kind of like support, like feeling that kind of you're not alone in it would also help. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. If you think back to the pregnancy two questions now about this Mm -hmm. one is what was your favorite moment and the other is what do you wish you had done differently um favorite moment Hmm. (laughs) i think so many to choose from um probably favorite moment was when we heard the heartbeat for the first time that was a good one i mean it was I think it was the beginning of a bunch of like swings back and forth, but that was one of the the bigger positive swings where we were going into that appointment. We were pretty worried that like this was the end, 
and it was going to be over at this point and then it's like oh not only is that not true but we can actually hear the heartbeat for which like it's not like we went to the appointment expecting like oh are we going to hear the heartbeat we weren't even thinking of that so that was yeah we're totally bracing ourselves for him to say yeah i'm sorry you lost the baby yeah exactly um so i i think that was that that was probably one of the most like like there was there's both the, the sense of relief and excitement at the same time mm-hmm. don't you love do you remember how loud he turned it up it was i yeah i remember it like it was echoing in the entire I know, it, room it was scary at first because i didn't know what that was like what's, <laughs> what's this like sound like what is happening like are your machines breaking like <laughs> like what's what's going on but yeah. it, it turned out it was just a heartbeat just a baby's heartbeat so. oh, no big deal it's just the baby's heartbeat yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and i think um I, I think like we talked about kind of for for what I wish I had done is I think maybe taking a step back and kind of appreciated a little more how, how like not let it get such a normal situation and like things that at the end like maybe like like treating it more like as, as serious as it was and like not going to to work like <laughs> like, like, like that and missing and, and in general kind of then I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's probably the biggest thing is, is, is at the time like recognizing how how not normal it, it actually was. I wonder why that happened. I mean, it's not like our did the doctors make you feel like it was normal? Like, I mean, I I know they said it's okay to go to work because work was technically so close. I don't, and they, I don't think they even thought. Well, I mean, it was kind of. We think you're going to deliver now. Oh, wait, you didn't. Maybe it'll be fine. Oh, wait, you delivered. Oh, yeah, because it was always every time we thought you were going to deliver, you didn't. (laughs) And then every time we felt safe, like, it switched back the other way. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. Um, But, um, I mean, I I, I think maybe partly that and maybe just, like, just the whole time, it it was, like, such a complicated pregnancy throughout the whole time that I just got kind of used to, like, the baseline is... Oh, something's bad's about to happen, or, or, or something dangerous is is going on. Yeah, that's really really tough. And so it it almost makes it seem like you should have a third person. You know, not your your doctor's in it with you. You're in it. Your partner's in it. Maybe there needs to be somebody else. Maybe it's a friend, a family member, mm-hmm. yeah. a professional of some kind going. No, it kind of, it makes sense that you're completely freaking out right now. It makes sense that you're feeling depressed, even though you're not carrying the pregnancy. I mean, just to really reflect back how difficult this is. Yeah, someone to remind you of that. Because like when when we're talking to each other, we're both like in it in our different ways. And we're both used to it. And it's kind of normal to both of us. But yeah, someone else who's, who's not kind of like used to it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the the ultimate thing here and the reason why I asked him to come on the podcast and so glad that you decided to come is to really... <laughs> well, and it, it was a choice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> now I can tell you that. It, it was a choice, yes. Okay. <laughs> but it's really to highlight that there is a very real, very big, very overwhelming experience that's happening in parallel to your experience, which is that of your partners. And they have a unique perspective. They have unique experiences of the exact same moments that you're going through. You're in the bathroom bleeding. You're on the sofa contracting. You're in the hospital hooked up to an IV. But they're right there with you going through it in a different way and the way that it affects them, the way that it presents and the way that they experience it isn't something that we're talking enough about. And I know that you're overwhelmed and I know there are moments and hey, I have been there where I'm just like, really you want sympathy right now? Really? (laughs) (laughs) But like I said earlier, when you have those moments when you are feeling good if even if it's five minutes even if it's two hours to take a breath and to turn to your partner and ask him or her how she or he is doing and check in with them and really build that bond and reconnect with each other because they're going through a whole hell of a lot 
that they're likely not telling you because they're either trying to be strong or they don't want to talk about it or they don't think you want to hear it, whatever that is, but they're going through it anyway. So to wrap this up, the question that I ask all my guests that I want, I would love to know from you, what are your final words of hope for couples who are listening and are going through a high-risk pregnancy right now? Well, I, I think... I think from our experience, it's just like so many times things looked like super dark and like nothing and there's like no chance of, of, of it getting better. And then so quickly things, things change for the better. So I, I think just to, I guess just to remember, like no matter what's happening, like any, all the possibilities are still on the table and like any, anything could happen. I love that. I love that. And I I love that phrase, anything could happen, because it really does highlight that there are two sides to that coin. Mm -hmm. And it really could just be anything. And that means just as much good as we're anticipating bad. Awesome. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And we'll do it again maybe next week, tomorrow? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see <laughs> about that. I, I've got a trip to Vegas that I'm overdue for. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was awesome. You Seriously, guys, it, it was like pulling teeth to get him to do this. But I think he did great. I think he did awesome. Um, and I'm glad that we were able to do this. And if you have further questions or if you want to do another episode for partners, um, let's do that because we're not talking about this enough. You know, as women, I mean, let's be real. We're not talking about high-risk pregnancies in general enough. But partners have it hard too. And there's a whole other experience that's happening in parallel to yours that needs to be addressed because it's affecting your partner's physical health, emotional health, and it needs to be addressed. We need to talk about it. I found this beautiful quote that I thought um, is something you might even be able to say to your partner right now, actually, that I thought is just so perfect for this episode. It's by Molly Friedenfeld. I think I said that right. And she says, if someone is facing a difficult time, one of the kindest things you can do for him or her is to say, I'm going to love you through this. And I thought that was so wonderful and something that you can probably just turn to your partner right now and tell him or her that you're there, you see them, you know they're going through a lot and you may not be able to be the best support at the time, but you are there to support him or her in the best way that you can. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you want to know more about how to get through your high-risk pregnancy, or if you're looking for support for your partner to get through a high-risk pregnancy, um, schedule a healthy high-risk pregnancy consultation, and let's talk about how I can help you support each other. It's a complimentary call, and all of my programs include partner support. So if you're looking for that, I would love to talk to you about how I can help. You can schedule that on my website at barijatdeshpande.com. And I'd also love to stay in touch. So follow me on Twitter or Instagram. The handle for both is barijatdesh, P-A-R-I-J-A-T-D-E-S-H. The last thing that you need during your high-risk pregnancy is one or both of you feeling alone and unsupported and overwhelmed to the point where it's affecting your health. This is a really hard time for both of you. And so the more that you can turn to each other, the more that you can reach out to your partner and just ask a simple, hey, how are you doing? That can make the world of a difference for both both him or her, for you and for the two of you as a couple. Take it one day, one step at a time. You can do this.